right, so welcome to Math 331 Problem Solving. We'll call this Lecture 2 to the 5th. What I want to do today is continue with requests from the class. Is there any problem anybody would like to request we do first? Any requests for what problem we should talk about first? Yes, request from the class. 2008 A2, <laughs> excellent choice. <laughs> Wonderful choice. I. So 2008 A2 by popular demand, Alan and Barbara are playing a game. They have a 2008 by 2008 board, and on your turn, Alan goes first, you place a real number in any open spot on the board. And if at the end of the time when all the spots are filled, if the determinant of the resulting matrix is zero, then Barbara wins, if not, Alan wins. So the question is, who has the winning strategy? And I don't think they even asked, what is that winning strategy? Let me see. Um, yeah, or, yeah. It just says, which player has the winning strategy? So if you want, you could give an existence proof that one of the players has a winning strategy without actually giving the winning strategy. Or you could actually give a winning strategy. So what are your first thoughts for a problem like this? Excellent. What do you think matters for 2008? Even. even. So it's probably not the prime factorization for 2008. It's probably maybe an even oddness. What do you think Barbara would love to get? Well, well, well we want to have a determinant of zero. So what could Barbara do? to get a determinant of zero? There's a, there's, she has multiple options. What's one? A row or column. One is for Barbara to get a row or column of zeros. Then on every turn, she keeps focusing on a row and tries to just keep putting more and more zeros there. If she does that, what do you think Alan would do? So if Barbara's strategy is to try to make a row or column of zeros, what will Alan do? You try to add a non-zero. So if we take a two by two matrix, let's say Alan goes first, and we'll have Alan put in A11. And now Barbara's going to try to put in a zero. Where do you want Barbara to put a zero? A12. So actually, so here, actually, this is a great choice for Barbara to put the zero here. And by symmetry, we can assume that Alan goes in A11 for his first spot. So she's attacking in two different directions. Alan valiantly tries to defend down here, and Barbara wins and is able to get a column of zeros. So do you think Barbara will always be able to get a column of zeros? Or... Could a two by two matrix just be such a small size that we're not really seeing generic behavior? This is the danger. You absolutely should be doing this. You absolutely should start off by looking at a two by two matrix, but it could be misleading. What should we look at next? So one possibility is to look at three by three. But I think it's like, it's not even, so. Yes, yeah, so, like, so the question is, you know, again, does this problem require us to look at lower matrices? No. We're doing this to build intuition. So you might say, I have a sense that I only want to look at even sized matrices. And so I'm going to skip the 3 by 3 case and go straight to the 4 by 4. Or you might say, well, maybe it is a statement that's true no matter what size matrix I have. And maybe if I'm focusing on evenness, I'm focusing on the wrong thing. So as an aside, Alpha is algebraic if there exists a polynomial with integer coefficients such that P of alpha is zero. So square root of two I equals the square root of negative one, the square root of four plus the cube root of seven, uh, nine. These would all be algebraic numbers. They all solve polynomials with integer coefficients. It turns out if you're not algebraic, 
we say you're transcendental. <coughs> Almost all real numbers are transcendental. The number of algebraic numbers is countable. So if you choose an algebraic number, you were lucky. Somebody give me a transcendental number. Yeah, almost anything you say will work, but if you choose a special number, give me another transcendental number. So if you're wrong, you will feel depressed. You still want to go with pi. You will fail. E plus one. E plus one, much safer. Give me another transcendental number. E plus two, or two E. Those are really, really safe. Pi is transcendental. <laughs> now here's a nice fact. E plus pi, or E times pi, is transcendental. We believe both are transcendental, but we only know that at least one of them is. Amazing fact. Can you think of any relations between E and pi? E to the pi i is negative 1. E to the, I'm going to do i pi is negative 1. This has absolutely nothing to do with the proof. Absolutely nothing. More generally, Alpha, beta, or alpha plus beta are transcendental if alpha and beta are transcendental. If you have two transcendental numbers, either the sum or the product is transcendental. Probably both. Not always. Can you give me two transcendental numbers such that either the product or the sum is not transcendental? Yes? One over E and E. Yeah, one over E and E, that product will be one. Or 1 minus e and e, their sum will be 1. But in general, two generic transcendental numbers, both the product and the sum is transcendental, we know at least one is. And with e and pi, you might think that this relationship e to the i pi is useful. So this is why I really want to just drive home this warning. When you look at problems like this, the danger is when you're building up intuition by looking at small cases, you could build up the wrong intuition. Uh, two of my favorite people for quotes are Mark Twain and Winston Churchill. So you know, one of Mark Twain's quotes is, a cat that jumps on a lit stove will not jump on a lit stove again, but will also not jump on a cold one. For each experience in life, only draw <laughs> the appropriate lesson. So again, I don't want to discourage you from looking at small cases. But in the two-by-two two case, Barbara was able to force a column or a row of zeros. Is that going to be true in the 4 by 4 case? Things are going to be more interesting now. So where should... I, I will start off as Alan. You guys can be Barbara. I will go here, A11. Where do you want to go? Now, we're just basically trying to get a row or column of zero. So rather than writing... A11 and all this stuff. How can I almost view this? Yeah, bigger version of tic-tac-toe. So rather than drawing, let me just draw a tic-tac-toe board. And so I'll go here. Uh, does it work if you go diagonal? No. Yeah. So that makes it a little bit harder. Do you think I should be able to stop you from getting four in a row? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we go to, if we go to the three by three tic-tac-toe game, you know, if I go first, I can stop you from getting three in a row. So I can stop Barbara in the three by three game from getting three in a row. Maybe the four by four game is a little bit harder. Where would you like to go next in the four by four case? Someone on the diagonal, so we'll go over here. So this is attacking for you this way and this way. So on my move, I want to stop another one of them. So I'll stop over here. So this O is still helping you this way, but that's it. 
If you try to put another O in here, I can then stop that immediately. If you try to go down here, you start a new row. I'll be able to stop it very easily. So I'll say you go here, I stop. You go here, I stop. And now I've already got something in every row and every column. Mm -hmm. So the point of this is that if you look at the two by two case, you might be led to the belief that Barbara can force a row or column of zeros. But when you do a little bit more exploration, when you look at the three by three or the four by four case, it becomes clear that Allen can actually prevent a row or column of zeros. That is not the only way Barbara can win. This is just the easiest way for Barbara to win, is to have a whole row or column of zeros. So we now know that if Barbara is going to try to win, that's not the way to go about it. So again, I'm just trying to go through thought processes. How do you attack something like this? <coughs> All right. So let's try to think, how else could Barbara win? Why am I concentrating on Barbara rather than Alan? Yeah, the determinant equals zero is a very special case. I just need to find a way to make that happen, and I know there's some structure in a matrix that has determinant zero. It might be easier to try to focus on ways to make sure that the determinant is non-zero. <coughs> but I, I like the idea of if your determinant is zero, I could have a column of zeros. I could have a row of zeros. How else could I have a determinant zero? Linear dependence. Linear dependence. So I need one row to be a linear combination of the other rows, or one column to be a linear combination of the other columns. Okay. Hmm. So if you wanted to try to show one row is a linear combination of the other rows, how many rows would you want it to be a linear combination of? Well, let's go to the 2 by 2 case. So... Bob goes here, what should Alice do? Okay, what should I put here? Like some multiple of that? No, 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 no. the same. <laughs> put the, I mean, you, you could do 2A11, but let's just put an A11. Now, does it matter? Let's, let's say Alan goes here and goes A22. So then Barbara goes there. So we weren't sure how many rows we want to be a linear combination of. Let's look at the two by two case and see if that can build up some intuition. Do you want to try the three by three case now? Or do you want to try the four by four? Four by four. Four by four? Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to do it with a tic-tac-toe board just because it's easier to see where things go. All right, I'm going to go here with an alpha. Alpha above it. So you'll go alpha above it. So I'm going to go here as a beta. Beta above it. I'll go here as a gamma. Gamma below it. And so now we're affected. We're going to end up with four columns of two effectively. Roughly, yes. So every time Bob, I'm sorry, every time Alan goes in either the first or the second row, Bob would just goes in the other one and just mirrors the move. If Alan goes in the third or the fourth, Bob goes in the other and mirrors the move. We can make this matrix extremely dependent. So the strategy is essentially whatever row Bob goes in first, Barbara goes in either the row above or below and does the <coughs> and does the same thing. And so now you have two rows that are linked. And whenever Bob does anything in this row, Al Barbara does the exact same thing in the row above, or vice versa. Yes. But if you want them to be linear dependent, don't the ratios have to match up? I'm sorry? Don't like the ratios. But they will. The the rows will be identical. The ratio will be one. Um, like if you put uh like so we'll keep going. Yeah. I'll go delta here. 
Yeah, and so it helps you here. And now let's say I put uh, theta here, I'll put theta here, d here, I know I'm not going in order, d here, uh, zeta here, zeta here, and my favorite. Anybody know what that is? The complex conjugate of C divided by C. So in this case, we'll actually have two rows that are the same here and two rows that are the same here. So in fact, this matrix has a repeated eigenvalue of zero. It's really dependent. Yes? Sorry, um, I don't really remember what you did that well, but don't you just need like... This is overkill. Okay, so if just the first two rows are yes, like correct. dependent. Then right, so what... Everything what, else is dependent. Right. What you could do is you could say, look at the first two rows, and every time... Uh, Bob, I'm sorry, every time Alan moves in one of them, you move in the spot immediately below or above. So would this work if we had a three by three matrix? <coughs> Here we rely on every row having a pair. So we can so Let's see if this would work with a three by three. <laughs> so how many people say it works? How many people say it doesn't work? How many people are not sure? All right, so I'll go here for alpha. What do you want to do, Barbara? Alpha above. Alpha above. So I'll go here for delta. <coughs> What do you want to do now? I guess that's what it would depend on. Probably on going in there. Go down to the last one, yeah. So you could do, so that's like a little bit of a delaying move. And then I'll do beta here, and then I'm going to force you now to go up top. So let's say you put a theta here. And then I'll put a pi down here. And now I can force the... So for 3 by 3, I think we can actually prove... And then, of course, you would have to say, well, what if you didn't go there? What if you went some other place? So it's not clear what happens for the odd case. Maybe there's a better strategy where... Barbara is still able to force a determinant zero <coughs> in the odd case. But it is nice that you can always have things appear. And here, because there's one extra row with an odd number of entries, I can do these delay moves and force you, Alan, to break symmetry. I'm sorry, force you, Barbara, to break symmetry. Okay, so this is 2018. So this is an even year. So again, I have no idea who's writing the exam. I could find out because I know people who've written the exam in the past. I don't know what they love or not. There are often problems on these exams that involve the numbers, and the numbers frequently matter only very little. Sometimes the parity of the number matters. And so just be aware that 2018 is even. And related to this, it is not prime. What's the next prime year? I don't know. Uh, 2019 oh, is well, not prime because yeah. it's divisible by 3. So it can't be 2020. 2021 um, is a possibility. Can you write a Z3 class L? Can we do that for uh, oh, just Just go to Wolfram Alpha and just type next prime 2018. I mean, that's all you have to type. <laughs> <laughs> it's more relevant to this class. <laughs> All right. Does anybody else? Yes. I, I have one. Okay, which problem? Number six, 1935. On okay, on which page? <laughs> the, the second page. Or like the back of the first page. Back of the first page, okay. Which, which one? Number six. 
Is that 2013 B1? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> 1995. Okay, so my pages might be in a different order than yours. All right, 1995. Right. Oh, 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 okay. I didn't see this on the back. Okay. Um, so this is a game starts with four heaps of beans? Yeah. Okay. So this is 1995. So four heaps. Each is three, four, five, or six. So here's the question. <coughs> Could all the beans have exactly three, all the heaps have exactly three beans? Or is one heap of three, one of four, one of five, one of six? Oh. How do you read this? It says, a game starts with four heaps of beans, each consisting, each containing three, four, five, or six beans. Because there are four <coughs> heaps, and they give you four numbers, maybe those are the numbers in each one. This is not a well written question. Mm -hmm. Is there a question mark at some point? Did you give it a clarifying question or did you have to? You can ask a professor who could clarify at either 101 p.m. or at 601 p.m. Could you just write, like, assuming <laughs> XYZ thing, then blah, blah, blah? So, what you, so, I mean, one possibility is to do the more general case where each one is either 3, 4, 5, or 6. Because if you can solve that, <gasps> And if you get the solution, you can say, specializing then to the case where each number occurs exactly once, we would also get that interpretation. Mm -hmm. I see. But be careful and make sure that you are interpreting the problem correctly. Is that what they would meant, like, be meaning to do then by the, like... I honestly do not know how to interpret this problem. <coughs> I would probably take it in the more general way, because if it's three, four, five, or six, then the problem is far more definite and you might be able to brute force it with less time. So on your turn, you can take one heap from a bean. So if <coughs> you can take one bean from that's, a heap. Oh, no, provide at least two beans are left yeah, in the heap. All right, so <coughs> if a heap has at least two beans left after you move one. So the, it has to have at least three beans currently. And then the last is <coughs> a complete <coughs> heap of three beans. Or two. two or three beans. Oh, of two or three. So you have to take one if there's more than three. Let's just. You are restricted. Let's you just have drop to it. So yes. you do three, four, or five, and then take the three beans of two and get rid of the other. <coughs> One, two, three, four. Wait. Yes? Can't we just like take one bean off of each thing from the start, make it two, three, four, or five, and then we get rid of the condition and the case where we can take three. Or is this thing dumb? No, but you could take the entire three beans. Well, the but two play. Well, the two players know. are moving alternatively, and so the question is, do you want to move first or second? <coughs> well, basically, yeah. each pile will have a bean that's just gonna have to sit there until at the end you take two. So that bean doesn't change anything. Oh, okay. So what you what you want to do is you want to basically remove that from the start. But what about but would, would that make a difference because if, it, if, the, if, the, if the heap has three, you could take it all at once? I would take away I the case where I would take out the condition on A. You can take one bean from a heap or a complete heap of two, both at once. <coughs> well, okay, so if you have a heap of three beans, you could either remove the whole heap, or you could take just one bean. Yeah. And so 
in my case, if you had to choose, you'd take more high school. I would take away the condition that you have for each year. Because if there's <coughs> if there's a heat, it's guaranteed to have at least two for one of these things I think you mentioned. Oh, you say you you can never have a heap of one. Yeah. So why not just text them out all the numbers and get rid of that one? I can I can see that for now. I, I want to keep it here just to okay. Wait, pass it. Well, technically, my thing's got to be the same because if you have a heap of one, then you can't take one and, and say you have to take two. Oh, if you have a heap of two, you can't take both of them. Right. Oh, you have to right, you have to take both. Yeah. Right. So I, I, I do think that you are, that you can almost say that the heaps of size may be two, three, four, or five, and just shift everything down one. I think, that's, I think that's a good simplification. I think that will work. I'm just wondering if we can look at it at a higher level. <coughs> so what happens on the moves? See, my, my first thought for a problem like this is to look at things, you know, mod or something like that and how is the number of beans being changed by moves yes um, in, in terms of sorry in terms of questions mm -hmm. itself so at least for things in equals one and six um, right. does the player know like how many beans there is in each heap right Why would that not make sense? <coughs> make sense to me like it makes sense. <laughs> I mean, you could you could read this as the first heap has three beans, the second has four, the next has five, and the next has six. Right. Is like redundant because it doesn't matter, right? Because like the player, like there's no like element of. No, but what if all the heaps have four beams? No, no, no. Uh, so that's what I'm saying. Like that's probably, like it makes sense that that would be the interpretation of the clip. Not that, not that there must be four heap of four different um, numbers, but that all four have to have the same number. But why? Why can't you have four heaps of four different numbers? Well, I mean, you can't, but just how the question's written, it doesn't... It seems like if that were the formulation of the question, it would have been a bit more clear for everything. Yeah, or like, if that was the formulation of the question, yeah, like, they wouldn't have needed to say it like this, right? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. I, we could just you, you could do the general case, and then... Or maybe it's easier in the case where it's 3, 4, 5, and 6. So I mean, if you want to do the case of three, four, five, and six, we could do that. And so you know, we've got three here, four here, <coughs> five here, and six here. Or did you want to do the other case That's for? Okay. That's the other case. Yeah. Okay. You have H one, H two, H three, H four. And then the question is, is the winning strategy going to depend on? the sum of the number of beans or something. So what if they, w if they all start <coughs> off with three beans? Can somebody force a win? Well, it doesn't ask whether there is a winning strategy or not. The question implies that there is, and you just have to figure out whether it's going to force the player. Mm -hmm. So that implies that actually it doesn't really matter how many Winning strategy. Well, no, but, but the, the answer of who wins could be a function of how many beans. It could be if the number of beans is odd or is congruent to zero mod three, then player one wins, else player two can win. 
So I can easily see the answer in a problem like this depending on <coughs> some quantity associated to the number of beans in each heap. Or possibly even the number of heaps that are one <coughs> log three. So you may maybe player uh, two can mimic what player one is doing. And if player one doesn't destroy a heap, maybe then player two destroys that heap or something like that. I'm talking about if H I is um, even. I mean, right. not even. If the mod three of one of those yes. um, is even, then the first. Well, when you say the mod three is even, does that mean it's uh, two so mod three? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or is it could it be zero mod three? Um, zero or two. Okay, so if it's zero or two mod three. Then the <coughs> person who takes a, a bean from that first win, that heap, like will take that heap last. Well, like we'll be able to take that heap. Okay, so let's say H one is so zero or two mod three. Yeah. I think you want to work mod two. Well, if it's zero, the first person can take it. Well, no, because there could be six. There could be six beans. Uh, uh, if it's six, then you can take the first person can take one. Then the second person would have to take. I mean, take the next one five. So the difficulty is when you get down to three beans, you could either take one bean or you could take the whole heap. So this could be a mod two problem. But I mean, to me, when I look at this, I see mod two and mod three. Yes. Can I just can we just cut it down to the two for all the time? Because we did this like because if it's bigger than three, we know that it's just gonna go back and forth. Well, Good. Like, so so if it's six, yeah. we know we have to do three moves yeah. to kill it from six. So I like this. So what we can do is anything that's above three, 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 we can just count how many moves does it take to get down there. Yeah, now gonna, that's good. That. Yeah, yeah. So good. So now we can assume that it's three, 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 three. And the cost <laughs> is in terms of the number of moves is going to be H1 minus three plus H2 minus three plus H3 minus three plus H4 minus three. Because when we have six beans, we have no choice. We have to take one. We have to keep doing it until we get down to three. <coughs> so if you look at this, um, because we have negative three four <coughs> times, that doesn't change the parity. So we only really care about H1 plus H2 plus H3 plus H4 mod two. That will determine essentially now who goes first. Is it player one or player two? Yes. Um, so it's always... The, the number of moves you're going to need to get to the left, <coughs> if they're all the same, right. then there's four of however many moves you have to do. Right. So that's easy. Wait, but, but, we, but we could have maybe, you know, um, five, 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 six. If we're looking at the most general case. Uh, okay, right. But what we've been able to show now is that we can essentially reduce this to the game where they're all three yeah. at a cost of possibly switching who is going first right. and in a very well-defined way. So now we know if we can analyze the case of 3-3-3-3 and see who has the winning strategy, now for the original game, the winning strategy will either still be that person if H1 plus H2 plus H3 plus H4 is even or over the other person if it's odd. So this is real progress now. So now we're down to the case where they're all threes. Oh, you just I think like yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I was gonna say, isn't it like the second person <coughs> gonna win? Because can't they just like mimic the actions of the first and then they should always be able to take the last thing? So if the so if the first person takes two here, you take two here. And if you can't take two, you can only take one. Oh, you can only take one. Right, right, right. Yeah. So so basi so basically can the second person, very similar to what we just did, mimic the first? For the first person to guarantee or like the, or not guarantee but make it like a zero two three three. Well, well, if, if the first person takes all of a heap, then, then the second person takes all of a heap, and now you're down to just two. 
<clears throat> but if like earlier they just uh, take the first heap, mm -hmm. and they can't. They can only take yeah, they can't a complete can. heap of two or three. Yeah. And so if you have four, five, or six, you have to take no, off one. But there's one of here. three. But they can t they can take off one, but the other person will just take off one. And then no, but like, so they they take the, the, order, order, oh. the order of the moves doesn't matter. It's just right. Mm -hmm. right. 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 Yeah. It's going to play out the same. Right. Okay. But it looks like if you have like... So I think right. that needs to be justified that the order of the moves doesn't matter. But I, 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 think, I think you should be able to justify it. Yeah. That you'll just remember, I now have to remember that I have to now mimic that move when it's my turn. So let, let, let's say we only had two heaps. Can we show in this place that player two wins? So like in the one heap case, it's obviously P1. In the two heap case, um, P1, like it, it kind of ends up being based on whoever can dictate like what the case turns into. Right, so it's gonna be two. It, right, so play one takes everything, two. play two takes everything. If play one <laughs> takes two, play two, I'm sorry, play one takes one, play two takes one, and, and then, then player one has to take two of one. And then for the three case, P1 can determine, like they can turn it into this case, except their parity's swapped. Do we need to look at the no. three case? No, no and then no, you the just like case shows just the it up. And then you just have they'll three, just take case. one off. <coughs> yeah, so I think this is another example of just mirroring. So very, very similar to the determinant game, where player two just mirrors what player one does. I mean, if we drop it to ones and twos, mm -hmm. then it's just a simple mod thing. Yeah. And player two makes sure it stays the same mod order. Yeah. And I think this is similar to the, some of the games we did on like the first or second day of class where you can choose either number one, two, or three, and you want to avoid the sum of 21 or something like that. And you just work backwards to see what you need to do and just trap in the cycle. There's another <coughs> problem that's related to this. Uh, the devil is feeling generous and is going to give you a chance to win back your soul. So you have a circular table, and you and the devil will place pennies, and all your pennies have the same size. And they must be entirely contained on the circular table. If even part of the penny is over, you lose. The last person to place a coin wins. So if you win, you get your soul back. If you lose, your soul belongs to the devil. And the devil is feeling generous and will let you choose if you want to go first or second. Okay, you want to go first? Where would you like to move? Center. You move in the absolute center. Now let's say the devil goes here. Where should you move? Uh, opposite side. Yeah, mirror copy. <laughs> let's say the devil moves here. Mirror copy. You can always mirror what the devil is doing. And so if the devil is able to move because you're mirroring, you can move as well. So this is an extremely common technique of just mirroring moves. Whether or not they will ask you something like that, I have no idea. But it's just worth being aware of something like that. Because we don't have that much time. Uh, I thought I would end with a good one. 2009 D1. So if you haven't looked at it, just take a moment to look at it first. 2009 D1. So show if n is a positive integer, then n is a ratio of products of factorials. Uh, a positive rational. A positive rational. Okay, so I'll just give everybody a moment to look at this. So if n is yeah. oh, if n is a positive rational number, show that n can be written as a ratio of products of factorials. Is it bad that I wrote n was an integer rather than a rational? Why? Because you can just take whatever 10 is and whatever 9 is. 
Yes, yeah, so if you have ten nights, do it for each one, and since it's a it's a ratio, that's the same thing. So the first simplification without loss of generality <coughs> and is an integer. Because if you had x over y, do x, do y, and then just two x over y. So you always want to look for problems like this. How can I simplify things? So rather than assuming my number is a rational, I can assume my number is an integer. So that's a really good simplification. <coughs> right, so I'll give people a moment or two. How many people have not looked at this problem? Okay, so I'll give you all just a minute or two to look at this as to what your ideas are. How many people have looked at this? Okay. Okay. Ten seconds. Do you have an idea how to do this? It sounds too easy, so I think it's probably wrong. Well, or that just means you've you've looked at it the right way. <coughs> For a lot of these problems, if you look at them the right way, then oh, of course. I mean, for a lot of our last problems, is just mirror the move and you're done. So what's the first thing you might want to try to do? Well, you can take n, which is n factorial over n minus 1 factorial. <laughs> and the n is at the end. But there's no prime. Mm. Oh, a, a, a factor of, of prime numbers, sorry. Oh. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, well, yes. So what should you be doing? Similar to that same thing, except take well, its prime yeah. factorization. Because I see. Okay, good. So, without loss of generality, n is prime. Because it, they, it says they don't have to be unique. So if you can do it if n is a prime number, then you just multiply them all together. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea is break it up into as simple steps as you can. Without loss of generality, n is an integer. Without loss of generality, n is a prime. All right, now what might you try to do next? Yes. Yes. Um, every number has a prime factor, every integer has a prime factorization. Right. And for every prime factorization. Well, right, that's what we have here. So right. now, we can, yes? So like, can't you do the same thing that like, what yeah. I said, where you do like n factorial over like the previous prime factorial? And then well, but then. No, but you, but you, but you have to have a ratio of prime num of factorials right. of prime numbers. So I can't do p factorial over p minus one factorial. Mm -hmm. You can do it. But you can do reduction. Uh, they're getting bigger. It's not as tiny as the last one. So it's prime. If you're doing it right, you can. This might be kind of similar to what you're thinking. I don't know, but maybe you could do like the prime factorization and like the p minus one, right? Since what should what should you do right now? Right now you're trying to prove the whole thing. Rather than trying to prove the whole thing, what should you do? Get some examples. Get build data. I, how do we do two? All right. How do we do three? Well, we only, oh, um, okay, you're right. Okay, so we'll just do 2s2 yes. factorial. Yeah. No, no, good. good call, good call. We'll just do 2s2 factorial. All right, three. Okay, how do we do five? Three factorial, two factorial, five factorial over. So we know it has to start off with a five factorial. Yeah. Three, three, three. Then we have a three factorial. And then we'll have a two factorial down below. Now, when you look at five factorial over three factorial, another two factorial. we need another two factorial. Right, now we're about to start seeing a pattern. How would we do seven factorial? What does seven factorial have to start with? Yeah, it's just like it's got to start off with a seven factorial. And then what would you like to put in below it immediately? Five factorial. Five factorial. Data! 
okay? Is it a lot clearer now what to do after doing these calculations here? This is the biggest obstruction people seem to have, is just spending some time just writing numbers down on a paper. So when we do 7 factorial over 5 factorial, we're left with 7 times 6. All right, the 7 is good, and now we have the 6. So we, we like out there with the 3 factorial. But what we know is when we look at 7 factorial over 5 factorial, <coughs> what's left is an integer with no prime numbers, 7 or larger. By induction, we can do it. So for the next one, 11 factorial, we know we'll start off with 11 factorial over 7 factorial. And now we're going to be left with 10 times 9 times 8. Well, the 8 we can kill with a 2 factorial cubed. The 9... Well, we can do 3 as 3 factorial over 2 factorial, so we'll have 3 factorial squared <coughs> and 2 factorial squared up there. 10 is going to be 5 times 2. And so I'm not going to continue to write. I'll just go like that. <coughs> yes? Can I ask a silly question? Uh, why is it that he's like intentionally doing primes for the... Well, because we know any number can be written uniquely as a product of primes. Oh, okay. So if, we can, so if we can just do it for prime, right. we do each one individually, and then we just multiply them all together. Okay. And so now what we've basically shown is when we look at 11 factorial over 7 factorial, we're left with an integer that has no prime factors 11 or larger. And by induction, we know how to handle all those prime factors. And this, what you're noticing is sometimes it's in the denominator, sometimes it's in the numerator. That's why it has to be a ratio of products. Mm -hmm. So the problem is not that bad. But to me, until I start to play it like this, I'm not quite sure how to proceed. But as soon as I start writing this down and start getting a sense of, well, how would I make 7 work? How would I make 11 work? Oh, okay. I can see when I look at 7 factorial over 5 factorial, I've got just the number 6 floating. And 6, the key observation is, has no prime factors larger than um, uh, 7. So again... These are just really good thought processes as to how to approach problems like this. Take your time. <coughs> gather data. Don't be afraid to try something. And be very concerned that if you take too special of a case, you might see the wrong pattern. It doesn't mean avoid doing special cases and avoid looking at patterns, but just be aware that you could see the wrong pattern. We saw that with the Allen Barber game, where Barbara can force a row of zeros or a column of zeros in a two by two case, but not in general. And we saw that there was a difference in looking at even versus odd boards. All right, good luck, enjoy.